Jillian. Let's start off by you just telling your backstory, how you got into copywriting. All right. I'm an accidental copywriter. (laughs) I started a business in 20... I'm going to say 2014. My son was born in 2013. And prior to that, I was working in person as a massage therapist and abdominal massage specialist. So kind of in the holistic, you know, women's healthcare industry. And when my son was born, I was immediately overcome with the urge, like a lot of women experience to not leave my home, to not work outside of the home and to stay with him because <clears throat> the bond, the bond, the attachment, like you just the breastfeeding, all of that, there's like an instinctual drive to remain connected. And so I just put my head down and ended up building a website and starting a basically, you know, it was a branch of what I was already doing, holistic women's health. Blogging was what I did in the beginning. I thought, ooh, you know, I got caught by all the articles that were like, make money from your blog. And you know what I mean? And then all of a sudden I'm realizing, okay, it needs to be not a blog, a business. So I started developing products and services and offerings. I had some amazing success. By the time 2017 rolled around, I had my first five-figure launch. It was a Jeff Walker style seed launch. Hadn't designed the program yet, just had the bones, the outline just crossed by one sale crossed into over the $10,000 mark. And I was so green and so naive. Like I was like, this is it. I have made it, you know, anyway, you have to, you have to figure out how to keep moving forward and keep sustaining that growth. So that was about 2017, the beginning of 2017. I went on to have some more success again, selling educational products, programs and services. And I had, I had great success. I mean, I, looking back on it, it almost seems, it seems highly experimental, very messy and not unorganized, but I was constantly pivoting. I was constantly doing something new. I was constantly tweaking. I was constantly throwing some new offering out there with almost like a different Not that it was detached from what I was previously doing, but there was a lot of experimenting going on, let's just say. 2018 was another big year. And so, yeah, I I have done a lot of things, I guess you could say. I don't know if you want me to segue right into how I kind of transitioned into the copywriting because it was actually after a couple years off that I reemerged as a copywriter. So, Well, um, I wanted to ask a little bit about, so tell Let's just go back for a second. What is abdominal massage? Is that specifically for pregnant women or is that just like a general massage therapy technique? I'm just curious. Sure. Great question. So I took a private training through a private educational, like a school, and it was, it, there are abdominal massage techniques for pregnant women, but my primary client was postpartum. So we were repositioning the uterus into optimal positioning after birth, like the uterus has all these ligaments that attach to it and it's movable. And so a lot of women have health issues and don't necessarily know that their uterus is in a suboptimal position. So I would, through manual massage techniques, go in and help to correct the suboptimal positioning of the uterus. So it was not internal work, if that makes sense. It was all external hands on the belly. And you know, it was a wonderful, a wonderful career, very impactful for women. But in terms of financially, you're super capped with work like that. It's just like the one-on-one model online. It's one-on-one. You're seeing a client one-on-one and it's taxing work when you're a mom because your child is breastfeeding and then you're like massaging people. And so you're just, I don't know if you've ever heard the term touched out But okay, it's a term that moms will use in the early phase of motherhood when they're super overstimulated with all of the touching. The baby's on you. It's just the baby is on you all the time. So I was super touched out and needed to move away from that. Okay. Yeah. So your digital products, were they, were you like teaching a massage therapy technique or like when you 
forayed into the digital products realm? Was it just you trying to scale your massage efforts into an online offer? I was starting to teach. Okay. Mind you, this is when I was new age. I'm ex new age now. So <laughs> which I want to get into too. <laughs> okay, good. Keep that in mind because what I did was first started to blog about the anatomy. It started out pretty basic female anatomy, but the farther I went, the more I think it went into the realm of self-worth and kind of in the, if you've ever been in the new age, you'll know, like, I don't know, it was all about self-worth and, and energy centers and, and that whole system of thought and yogic philosophy. So it veered into all of that. And then it started to veer into like self-worth and your relationship to money. And then it started to veer into business. Like it was all over the place looking back on it. So, yeah. But it sounds like you had, you, you made quite a splash in terms of doing business coaching as well. So I don't know if I'm jumping ahead in your story, but did you get into like the online coaching space as part of that offer? Was that different? That started to happen in about 2018. So my big splash with the, my first cross into the five figure program launch was about that self-worth and connection to your, your womb and all of that stuff. Again, new age, you know, undertones on all of it. And then after I had so much success with that program, I went on to turn that live program into a digital version of it. And the next time I sold it, it did 17K in one launch and it was all digital. And that was, that was it for me. I was like, wow, like this is amazing because I had no one-on-one calls on the calendar no one-on-one calls, no work, no work, no deliverables. Like now I can say deliverables as a copywriter. There's no deliverables. There was nothing to deliver. My automatic email system was just dripping out their content. And that money came into my account as I was in in an Uber on the way to an event in New York City. And I just felt like totally changed. I was like, what just happened? You know, coming from one-on-one work where you're super capped with your income and then feeling that potential that experience is what kind of like helped me pivot into the business kind of coaching, you know, business mentorship arena. I was in connection with a lot of women in the women's health industry who wanted to know how I was getting these results. I I'm, could be a natural teacher, I think, not to children. I'm I homeschool and I'm a better teacher to, you know, an adult. I would be a better high school or, you know, university kind of a level teacher. But anyway, I started to teach these women that I was in connection with about what I was doing to get results. These women were so accomplished. There were some women, you know, around me who had these, you know, Ivy League educations and they were trying to do their online stuff in the women's health industry. And here I was this 20 something, just like knocking it out of the park, you know? So I felt like I had a lot under my belt and a lot to teach. And that was my pivot into the, into talking about business more. Got it. Okay. So it sounds like everything was going great with the digital products and launching and all that stuff and the online business. And then it sounds like you took a bit of a break. Tell me about that. I hit some hard moments in business. I'll tell you all about them, right? We can share the highlight reel, but it's like the hard stuff that's so valuable too. So I had a couple failed launches mixed in Maybe in 2019, there was a there was a launch that I anticipated to do 20K. Cause again, you think you're on this trajectory. You have more people in your email list. You're like, yeah, the numbers, it all lines up. I had this launch, launch, you know, mapped out. It was supposed to do over 20K. It's sh- in my mind, it should have. And we did like 7K. And it was just like a huge blow because we had just moved into a new house. I had just given birth to my daughter, my second child. And that was a hard thing. Then not long after that, I started to be pretty outspoken about what was going on in 2020. And I really couldn't keep my mouth shut. And I really, really made people unsubscribe fast. Like, (laughs) and I just couldn't, I just couldn't cap it. I think I was a little bit of an unrefined entrepreneur where I just couldn't separate business from what I truly think like think and thought. And maybe that's 
maybe it's just an, an urge to be honest or an urge to say what I'm thinking, you know, as, and as a writer, like that's what I was doing. I was writing about what I saw, the patterns, the things that, you know, long story short, a lot of my colleagues, I lost a lot of colleagues. I lost friendships. I lost business connections. I had one-on-one clients turn around and say, I, I want my testimonial off of your website. I can't support you. I can't support your work. I really turned a lot of people off as I found my voice. And so it was very draining. And picture this, on the side of all of this going on, you're a mom. So you have kids to take care of and they need you. They need to eat good food. They need to be tended to emotionally. You have a home. And so it was really natural for me to just pause and kind of let everything come to a halt so I could find, I guess, a center place and maybe rest a little bit and reestablish my priorities. And that break was very fruitful, super fruitful for me. It was hard to do. I wondered if I should, how I should handle expenses that I had carried for years related to software, stuff like that. Should I just unplug this whole thing? Like, what am I doing? You know? So it was a huge, huge break of unknown, un- time of unknown for me. And then take me through. So you have this break, like how long does that last until you kind of reemerge? And I'm assuming the reemergence was you getting back to copywriting as a service, correct? Yes. Well, during the break, I came to Christ. So I realized that my worldview of believing in what I'll call ascension theory, I used to believe that we were all ascending. I came to the conclusion that that worldview was false and it was founded on falsehoods, I'll say, or deception. And so when I came to Christ, it's a wild story because I was the person who was gifted the Bible, who was trying to ethically dispose of the Bible. Like I was like, how does one ethically dispose of the Bible? Like that's how far away from the Bible I was. I had a lot of preconceived ideas about it, what was in it, what it was used for, who, you know, all these things. So during my break, when I started to read the Bible, I mean, it was not foreseen by myself that that would be something I was willingly and with a genuine curiosity doing. And when I came to Christ and when I fully shed my old worldview and came into this new biblical worldview, I I was asking myself, what can I, what can I recover or salvage? What can I salvage from all these years in business? Like, what is it? What can I salvage? Obviously I, you know, I let all those programs go that were filled with a lot of things that I no longer believe. I stopped promoting those things and even deleted some old things, like just took that risk and was like this content I made hard work, but let me just wipe the slate clean, you know? And I was trying to figure out what I could salvage. And in my deep rest, in my deep break, I came to understand that it was copywriting. And it was actually an amazing long-term client who had reached out to me to ask me for help with her writing that helped me segue into the copywriting because she is not a natural writer and she needed a website written. She needed sales material written. I had already written 50 some odd sales pages for myself. I had been reviewing other entrepreneurs, sales pages and sales sales material in business already. And so this one amazing godsend client really helped me transform what I'm doing and how I can show up in business in the marketplace. And she, she turned me into a copywriter. That's amazing. I I feel like God does send those few people to encourage you and let you know that not all is lost and that you are on the right path. Because as you are speaking, I'm thinking about the times where I have gotten backlash from people, which is happening more and more often as my audience grows. I've got a message requesting that I put a trigger warning on my Instagram profile because I shared a devotional from the Bible, from a, my, my Bible app. So there needs to be a trigger warning that I'm going to talk about religious topics. Someone emailed me because I s- said in my email, 
guys, blah, 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 blah. And I misgendered my email list subscribers. So I got an angry email saying like, you know, most of your subscribers are women and you misgendered us. I was told that another thing about misgendering, we have to be careful. Oh, I have to say folks now instead of some other pronoun or something. So I've been getting, you know, it's crazy. Everything has become like politicized. I'm moving to Florida soon. I've gotten messages saying like, why would you move to Florida? Because I guess now Florida is whatever, not the place to be. It's it's political. I guess now with Ron DeSantis, Florida has become the new hate, you know, hated object. So, but then I've had people like you, like Chantel, like other people have reached out to me and been like, your story connected with me. I'm a Christian too. And like you, Jillian, I was very into new age. I'm a certified yoga instructor. I traveled across the world to receive that education in Costa Rica. I had all the books. I was in all the programs, personal development. So yeah, it's, I like what you said about that one client who was like, Hey, you know, I still need your services, even though you had lost all these other connections because I have lost friendships, connections, colleagues, and I've gotten backlashes and the unfollows and the unsubscribes as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's hard. It can be rough out there. It really develops a sense of character, wouldn't you say? Yeah. And I, but I feel like I'm still in the thick of it because I don't, because I see people who are really outspoken and I don't feel like I'm one of those people. I think it's like, partly because I'm afraid of backlash, but partly because I don't want to exclude people who think differently from me. Cause like, I want everyone to feel like they're welcomed in my program. So I don't feel like, like there's a woman I follow named Kim Jimenez and she's very outspoken about her beliefs and she runs this big business. And I'm like, I don't know how you do this because you're pissing people off left and right. And you don't seem to care, but I think people like you, people like her are just like really strong in their convictions and you have that courage. And like, I want to become someone who's like that. I just don't know if I'm there yet. (laughs) It's so funny whenever someone reflects back to me that I have courage because I don't feel that way. I really don't. I think it's just moment by moment hitting publish and truly my entire career online has been a moment of being afraid and hitting publish anyway. So I don't feel courageous. I just, I like to respond to my ideas. I would say that overall, I feel somewhat of a moral, I don't don't know if you would call it a moral responsibility, but when I get this like lightning bolt of an idea for a piece of content or something to say, I like to see myself as a disciplined person who can then refine that and publish, refine it and publish, if that makes sense. So yeah, I, I don't feel courageous a lot of the time. So, and my, my views definitely negatively impacted my revenue. So I'm on the other end of that, that bold woman who you referenced, Hey, I went that route. I was super bold. And because my email list was a certain political vibe, I lost a, I, my revenue went down. Like that was what happened. And so, you know, me stepping out and starting again, there's a fresh slate and it's like, okay, who, who do I want to have on my email list? Who is reading these emails, reading the room and just starting from scratch and knowing that same as similar to you, I don't want to exclude people who think differently. And I also don't want to, I also want to respond to those those ideas and instincts or nudges for content and things to say. So that's the thing. It's like, do you want to make, what is worth having those big launches to have a bunch of people who assume you think and believe a certain way when then they're just going to turn around and be disappointed. And when they find out, you know, what your true beliefs are. Right. Right. Which is, it happened to me a lot of hate mail, a lot. Can't believe I bought this from you. Can't believe you think this. And that was happening with the gender identity ideology stuff more so than anything. When I started to speak out against that, that was when I got the most hate mail I have ever (laughs) received. So I think a lot of the time we have to remind ourselves, okay, this person, this person is raging against an idea. I just happen to be the spokesperson for this thought or idea right now. Like, it's not about me personally. This is about them holding tight to their beliefs. 
and protecting their worldview ultimately. Yeah. And I like, like on your website, you had like a, a, a blurb of like, Hey, this is what I believe. And if you want more resources about this, email me at this email address and I'll send you resources. I feel like that's like a classy way to open up a dialogue and want it to truly be about information and facts versus like keyboard warrior. I'm just going to leave nasty comments or whatever. Right. That's one thing I've held a standard with. I've tried to is being polite. Like I've just tried to be polite in a world where everybody's really reactive and ready to fight. Like, Hey, I could do, I could do that too. I have fight in me. Sure. Like, you know, but I try to stop and be polite and just make those interactions a good exchange. Even if the other person is never going to, is, isn't anywhere close to considering my viewpoint. What about like motherhood and homeschooling? Cause you said you homeschool. I've had a few different women on the podcast talking about like balancing motherhood and freelancing. And it's not something I have personal experience with because I'm not a mother. So I'm curious about your choice to homeschool and your thought process on like working and, and being a mom and balancing that. Great question. So I, the area that I live in, a lot of people send their children to private school because the educational system down here, for whatever reason, the public schools are ranked a lot lower. And there's this interesting ranking system. And I'm from New Jersey where public school really wasn't all that bad. I mean, I had a great education in public school. Obviously, there was propaganda and you know all kinds of things. But in terms of my actual education and all the basics and then beyond, it was it was a wonderful experience. And I was very pleased looking back on it. I'm very grateful is the, is the word. So for me, you know, my husband and I are very protective of the kids and it's really just about these formation, these years of this, their minds forming that we want them in a safe environment where they can ask questions and they can just generally be kids. And so, you know, I just, it's hard to explain how I got into becoming a homeschooling mom. I really, again, just like the copywriting, it's just, it just happened. It just happened where it's like, okay, this is what we need to do now. This is it. And so my workflow is changing in September. So the summer is a great time for me to get an extra work session in for the copywriting work and for business building admin, you know, really all the stuff that's required in the behind the scenes of running a business. And, you know, I'll wake up before the kids and I'll get a nice two hour work session done before they're even awake. I love it. It's so nice. That's my deep thinking time. You know, it's quiet thinking time and I'd batch work, which I'm sure you have experienced batching work so that you can stay in your lane mentally uh, and have success with that. And then we all do a breakfast flow and I do a cleanup and you know, start laundry, kind of drop into home mode a little bit. And then after the breakfast flow and the cleanup in the summertime, I do a second work session for the copywriting and for the business. Come September, I'm my second work time block after breakfast is becoming a homeschool time block. So it's just about looking at the quarter ahead, really, for me. What is required? How do I structure things? Do I need to shift where I wake up one hour earlier? What do I want to do? There's a lot of flexibility, but I can really get a lot done with one two hour time block every day. And the way that I'm, you know, rebuilding my business is I'm doing one on one services now. I have a low tier digital offer, it's like $37. But as I get this next couple of years going, my goal is to develop a signature program under $1,000 that doesn't require in the moment work. So similar to the success I had previously in the other, you know, industry or area, I'm going to do the same thing, but I I definitely want to walk through uh, a variety of one-on-ones, a variety of different things. So I can really refine it and make something that has longevity, like a long shelf life is what I'm looking for. So my kids you know, they get a lot of free time, a lot of independent time, a lot of time to run out in the yard. We garden, 
there's time to do the chores and take care of the chickens, the animals. So I'm sure somebody would look in at my life and be like, you're not doing enough with homeschooling. And for me, it's just like, you know what we're doing? I I'm doing what I have mapped out. And eventually my son, I will bring on a tutor for him. Eventually when he gets to a point with math that I just can't, I'm just going to come up with solutions on the fly. So we are working through it. (laughs) That's amazing. I think something that a lot of writers are going to ask at this point, because I have so many women listeners who are mothers or going to be mothers soon, and they might be saying, well, Jillian, that's nice for you, but I have to hustle and I have to go out and make this full-time income. And what would you, what would your response be to that dilemma? You'll never get the, the years back. Sacrifice somewhere to enjoy the time with your child. I mean, we went through major sacrifices financially when I decided to take my break, like one vehicle, like stuff that, you know, is not flashy and cool, whatever I could do to just pare it back so that I didn't have stress. We did that. And so it's really worth it. I mean, you will never get that time back. I look at my daughter who's four and I'm like, like it's, it happens and it happens fast. And these are those formative years that it's like, it's so precious. You know, I'm very excited that, yeah, I'm just very excited that I made that decision. And another thing I would say to a new mom who definitely needs to make money from home is really reflect on how valuable your time is and assess your offerings. I never came down on my rate. Like my rates have always been expensive. I'm going to say expensive. I never started at beginner rates in copywriting. I just, there was no way it wouldn't be worth it. I'd rather not. I'd rather not work at all than charge a low, a rate that's too low for me, I'll say. You have to know what your time is worth. You have to know how to be very effective with your time. It's not necessarily, you're you're getting paid to solve problems not sit there and, and you know what I mean? So it's like, solve the problem, boom, move on and charge well. Yeah, that is so key. I could not have put that better. It's like, that was my mindset as well. And I don't think I was able to communicate it as eloquently as you did, but like, it was literally between this is either going to be worth my time and I'm going to charge this fee or I'm not going to do it at all. And that doesn't, compute for a lot of people because they're like, no, 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 I need to make something. It's like, no, you need to give up and and walk away from the low rate and wait for someone who will pay you what you're worth. And not a lot of people know that when they first start out. And, you know, it's interesting what you were saying about homeschooling your kids and like they have a lot of free time and they have autonomy over themselves because we just did a coaching session in my course yesterday. And I had a coach, a mentor come in and she was like, you know, the reason why we always feel like we have to ask permission or we don't feel qualified. And we have this imposter syndrome is probably because we were conditioned from the time we were in school at the very youngest to ask permission to even go to the bathroom. And that, that continues up until you're a senior in high school, probably even for some people in college asking permission for everything. So it's a hard pivot when you have to go into business and choose yourself, as I like to call it, and raise your hand for opportunities, create spec pieces, take this initiative and put yourself out there and stop waiting for permission when we've really been conditioned by our school system to literally ask if we are able to use our freaking bowels. Yeah, it's that makes a lot of sense. It's a great point. And that definitely does a great job describing that uncomfortable feeling of having to go out and basically claim what you want in the marketplace, put a price on it, and then hold firm. And, and yeah, that's definitely a good way to describe the the operating system that you have to kind of break out of. I mean, I was blessed to get to go through that experimental phase where I got to break out of a lot of stuff like that, fear of what I'm charging, fear of running a program, fear of, you know, being perceived as salesy, fear of calls, whatever, you know, so I have gone through a lot of that stuff and yeah, there is a lot of learn entrepreneurship. I mean, there's so much self 
work and development and like facing fears. It's like, it's a whole built in part of the, the job description. Yeah. And I also want to double down on what you said about making certain sacrifices to make things work financially, because this is another, I think, corner that a lot of people back themselves into. Obviously, I speak to a lot of aspiring freelancers who are just getting into this or trying to figure out how to pivot from their full-time job or they're unemployed and they want to become a freelancer. And personally, for me, I was unemployed. So I was in a pickle and I had my back up against the wall, but I also had a meager savings account and I had the ability to live really frugally and sacrifice a lot. So I was not going out to dinner. I was, you know, I drive a used car that I bought in cash and that's the unglamorous stuff that people don't want to accept because we're really fed so many get rich quick schemes, so many rags to riches, millionaire overnight which I'm like really guilty of consuming a lot of that content and, and being so sucked in. But when you hear these stories, it doesn't sound glamorous to say, well, I drive a used car and that's why I was able to transition into freelancing because I don't have a car payment. So I want to underscore that as well, because unless you have some financial literacy and know how to scale your life and your needs back in order to make this pivot and take a chance and become self-employed, you're going to constantly feel so stressed out. And there's going to be so much pressure on, I need to get clients. I need to make this work because your financial life is a mess. Whereas if you just give up the damn dinners and the Netflix and the cable subscription, you at least have peace of mind. Right. Right. And you cannot put a price on that peace of mind because the business you will build with that peace of mind is extremely different than the business you will build when you're stressed about the next month's money, the next week's money. It's a very different business that I'm building now than I was back when I started because I took a lot of risk. I took a lot of risk. The expenses went up and up and up. Well, you know, it's, and then when you realize you want to take a break, you're like, wow, look at that. Look at the numbers on paper. The numbers don't lie. And so I'm all about being frugal while I rebuild. And we have to know, you know, in this world of social media, we see, and I know people have probably said this, you've probably said this. It's like, we see the highlight reel. We see these like awesome posts and it's like, we we don't see the whole picture. And we have to keep in mind, what do I need to do? What is my whole picture? You know, and uh, yeah, it's just something to be mindful of and that I'm mindful of that. Yeah, that's really key. Something you mentioned before about Jeff Lerner, that is it Jeff Walker? Jeff Walker. And he teaches like a launch framework. There's this copywriter that I follow who learned from him as well. She's an email copywriter. And she kind of had this like epiphany moment that everything she had learned from Jeff Walker was like super effective, but that she felt like way too salesy and kind of like is now into ethical copywriting and all that stuff. Did you find when, I'm just curious, when you were doing Jeff Walker's programs and his sales methodology, did you feel like it was like manipulative or like mind control? (laughs) Well, great question. I disclaimer, I never took Jeff Walker's actual program, but I did read his book launch and implemented some of his strategies, you know, some of the things that are crossover in other books, you know, we've read. So the social proof, you know, I don't think that I, nothing is popping up as a red flag with his stuff right away. A lot of the slimy, like manipulative stuff I came across was more with the one-on-one high ticket. Okay. So the one-on-one high ticket, high pressure, have you ever been on the ending, the, the phone call on the other end of those where they're like trying to get your card on the phone and it's like the, the investments like five figures. Okay. Those that's where I identified a little bit more of these red flag manipulative you know, things going on, the salesperson or the person on the other end of the phone, not giving you enough time to make a decision. You saying like, oh, I'm going to run this by my husband. Then being like, why would you need to do that? You know, it's like, 
excuse me, like I can make a decision here, you know? So yeah, I didn't, I don't think any red flags popped up with the launch seed style launch Jeff Walker launch for me personally, but I know everybody has their own views on like how they feel about the timer on the page. And I try to work with people where they're, where they're at. Does, do you want the timer on the page? I'll give my strong recommendations. You know, there are certain things where certain things I don't like to do that. I, and I actually can't even think of an example right now, but I like to be more cognizant of my copywriting now than I was then when I was like highly experimental, trying to figure it all out, you know? For sure. So actually one of the most common niches or industries that people want to get into is writing what is called like launch copy, which it sounds like you're doing that primarily it's landing pages, email sequences, sales pages, what would, what advice would you give to copywriters who are trying to get into that space? Because in my personal opinion, it's a little bit difficult for newer writers to break in. And you're someone who has a unique background of being that person who was creating offers and doing the marketing yourself. And now you're, you're in this copywriting role where you're creating these sales pages and you have real life experience, which a lot of copywriters just don't have. So what would you say to them? What's your view on the marketplace and the industry? Yeah, that's a great question. It's like how to break into launch copywriting when you don't have that launch success yet, or those numbers or the stats. Mm, That's a great question. I would say there's got to be someone that you know, who's doing great, like with their launches or promotions, how can you start to study their audience and make yourself valuable to that particular niche or that particular person's, you know, I would think what, like go over your connections. Who do you know? Who, who would be a kind of an easier open door for you to maybe get behind the scenes of their, their launches, their business, watch what they're doing. You know, launch copy is Number one, with the emails, right? You definitely have to go into that deep research mode, just like with all the copywriting and really get in tune with that particular reader and that particular pain and need of that reader. So I think if I was trying to break into that space, I would be asking myself, who do I know who is doing that? Who have I come in contact with? How can I get in the room with those people if I don't know too many people? How can I make myself valuable? Can I write them some podcast pitches to start? Can I show them what I know? Can I write something else for them while I'm kind of trying to, you know, because once someone establishes a connection with you and you get their brand voice and you get their customer, it's so much easier for them to turn to you and be like, please write this for me. Can you look at my launch emails? The other thing you could do is be a student of those launches. I mean, for years, that's what I did too, was like sign up for this. And I would watch, what are these emails? What are the subject lines? How many emails come in? Be on the back end, be the customer, watch what's going on and do that across different, different promotional, you know, different launches, you know, a lot, there's a lot to be said about being a good student. And then when it comes time to like pitch that potential client, just do the scary pitching, like just, just do it. Yeah. That's really good advice is like be the end consumer. And that's for any niche that that advice actually translates to any copywriting niche. It's like, if you can actually say you have experience with the product and you are on the receiving end of those marketing materials, you're going to be able to write so much better. I also think that writing launch copy for coaches is Honestly, if you're brand, brand new to freelance copywriting, I don't think it's the best place to start because it's such a conversion oriented uh, style of writing. It's like you're going straight into the copywriting. Whereas for me, I got my foot in the door content writing with blogs. So I think there's lower barrier to entry if you're in a less conversion oriented field. And then as you become a content writer and learn someone's brand, then you can really start pitching them and be like, hey, we should write an email campaign. We should write an ebook. Oh, I should write your webpage. You can kind of like upsell them from there. So 
talk to me about your journey of learning copywriting because it sounds like you are self-taught pretty much. I'm the self-taught person in the room. I <laughs> I'm in these, you know, groups with copywriters and I'm like, "Oh, y'all bill like that?" Like I literally come from, you know, all the digital marketing stuff and so I would put people on payment plans for their deliverables. I never, still to this day, I'm about to implement for the first time, try it out, the 50% upfront, 50% right before the deliverable goes out. But I literally just kind of, you know, made up my own backend system for delivering everything. Obviously, I have a good, you know, contract and all that stuff. And it's important to have all that. But yeah, I'm I'm self-taught. So I learned through experience and then became a student. So it was. Well, I was studying as I went, marketing, launching, promotion, but actually being a copywriter, the back end of that has been the bigger learning curve. How do I serve my client? How do I get their brand voice dialed in? How do I, you know, because I was writing for myself. So I was like, all right, what is this person's, you know, brand voice? What is the language they use? What is the language they don't want used? How do I get underneath them kind of and, 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 be really good at that. And so more of my learning has been, uh, you know, reading books to figure that out, signing up for offerings, other people's offerings and trying to improve in that area. And so, yeah, there's pros to, to learning on the go. I, I have some stats and some data to fall back on. It really helps when you can be like a consultant for your clients versus just an order taker or just a contractor because and a lot of freelancers who don't have your background a lot of copywriters who don't have your background maybe won't feel as confident saying hey I don't think you should do this I think you should do this here's my recommendation but we really all regardless of our experience should be doing that even if it's like something you learned maybe you don't have firsthand experience but maybe you're a really good researcher and you can say listen I see this working for this company I think you should do this that's I would say one of the big differentiators between the copywriters who get the repeat work and who build long-term relationships with clients and become that partner, that consultant versus just the copywriter who gets assigned something, they deliver the work, and then the client kind of just falls off. Too many freelancers are order takers versus consultants. Yes. And there, like you said, there's so much, there's so many pros to being that consultant and being in that position. And I find that if I get behind the scenes with a team and I'm working on copy for someone new and their team is like, I find immediately, this is interesting. I just want to be in charge of all of them. I'm like, this is what to do. Don't do this. We can't do that. And it's hard for me to, to just step into a new you know, group of people who've been operating together and then like have such strong opinions about how to at execute things. So I actually navigate some of my own personal challenges, trying to find the balance between like walking into the room and like, you know, and then, but it's in me to try to direct the marketing. It is, a, it, I would say that I'm a marketing director before I'm a copywriter. The marketing direction is what informs the copy. If you can't give marketing direction, the copywriting is a little bit more like, I'm not going to say noodly. That makes absolutely no sense, but it's not as strong. You've got to be firm with your clients and tell them what you see. And again, just like you said, even if it's research-based, you know, don't be afraid to like state it up front. You know, this is what I can see working and we need to do this and not this. My client, one of my main clients, she, if she didn't have my marketing direction, oh, I just, it's hard to explain. It would be such a long drawn out process that she was, she would be in. Like, I want to save her time. I want to save her money. I want to shortcut it for her. So I'm happy to just tell her. And she's great. She just takes it. And she, she's like, thank you so much. Some clients, there's pushback. I'm sure you've experienced like they don't necessarily trust you yet or they have another voice in their ear. It's hard to figure out your role sometimes in that. Yeah, I always just try to come with an idea and I'm open to whether they shoot it down or not. But I feel like, okay, I did my due diligence. I want to step beyond and 
offered this service or recommended this thing. If they don't take it, they don't take it, but it's always worth it to try. I'm, I'm really big on getting more work from one person versus going out there as a copywriter and having to hustle, hustle, hustle for new clients. Even though the strategy I teach is cold pitching to teach freelancers how to get those opportunities. It's not sustainable to burn yourself out and do that for a lifetime. You have to develop a strong client base with repeat business. And that's one of those traits to have to, to build those relationships is to be enthusiastic and come to the table with ideas, even if they get rejected or shot down. Right. Right. And there's always more work with one client you know, you've already learned the brand voice. You've already understood the customer, the client. It is super smart to shortcut that research time and to keep coming back with solving their problems. Hey, I see that you could use this. What's your, I don't know how you book if you do quarter, you know, quarterly booking, but you know, I, what's your Q1 like, what is Q2 like for you? What do you, you know, I could see you might need this. I love that. That's good advice. Yeah. Personally, I try to get my clients on a monthly retainer with content Mm. and it's just kind of like, Hey, until we decide to stop working together, let's agree to this monthly ongoing work. And that's why content for me has been such a bedrock of my income is because there's always a monthly blog. Whereas with like my email and and ebook work, that's when we get into like the quarterly, Mm. but it, that's a nice mix for me because if I'm doing a landing page in an ebook and it's like, you know, I can plan that out quarterly, whereas the blogs are just every single month. Right, right. Ongoing blogs. And do you ever feel like, do you ever feel like you would move away from blog writing? Have you ever gotten that pull, like reading other content or tell me about that? I would like to start moving more into shorter form like email and maybe like LinkedIn social posts just because blogs and ebooks are pretty time consuming. But yeah, I don't know. I I, I feel like I've had a hard time kind of getting completely away from the blog work because I'm just so comfortable there. (laughs) Mm, Yeah, it's interesting, you know, and it's it's every writer is different and everybody's background is different. And I have come across writers who love to write blogs. And then I've come across other writers who, you know, would rather sub like contract out for blogs. And I think I'm kind of the second, I I think I'm the second person. I like to be close to the point of sale. I'm trying to sell stuff. Like I'm like trying to book sales and signups. And so blog writing for me is it's harder because I feel far away from the sale. It's yeah. just interesting. But I've written some great blogs that I'm very proud of for clients. And obviously it contributes to their business ecosystem. So it's very valuable, but it's definitely an area where I I am starting to subcontract out yeah. for blogs for my clients. One of the easier deliverables to subcontract out because you just have a writer do like the time investment for you and then you can quickly edit it and kind of bring it up to the right standard. That's the one piece of copy that I've been able to easily, or piece of content I've been able to easily outsource is blog writing for that. So, and I just love blog writing for beginner writers in general, because it's a really low barrier to entry. If you, I always say, if you can write a school essay, you can pretty much write a blog post. You have to learn SEO, but as long as you understand like an introduction, a body and a conclusion, you're halfway there. Yes, yes. And I like to, you know, work backwards from how this piece of content is contributing to an upcoming launch too. So that could be some, you know, some of your listeners could be segueing into launch in that way, helping with writing the blogs, and then moving into how does this blog post point to what they're selling next quarter, or, you know, however it goes, it can, it can all fit together like that too. What's your outlook for this career for women who are mothers who want to get into this and they're wondering how they're going to juggle it all? How they're going to juggle it all? Well, let me think about that. They're fearful of having to juggle too much, maybe. I would think keep it simple, stay focused, develop one 
great, I'm going to say sales page, even if that is a more of a services page that links to, yeah, develop one core page that points to one. It's obviously better when it points to one thing, but if you have multiple services, you can technically have, let's just say three things on that page and try to corral people to that page and make sure that those things that are listed on that page are things that are not sucking too much time and causing too much admin and being difficult. Like be smart about what is the service? What is he, what am I offering? Position it as a solution to your person's problem. Keep all your marketing clean like that. And then instead of just being like, not the jack of all trades, but running around and writing product descriptions and then writing this and then writing that, try to have an organized, you know, system like that right out of the gate. That's what I would do. And it's going to save you stress, like mental stress. I think it's also going to help you batch work. If you kind of narrow down your core offerings, can they change in the future? Yes. You can totally scrap it and change them out. It's totally fine, but don't, don't be afraid to make a nice, simple, sales system for yourself and stick to it. You would be surprised. People think, and I know you've said this, Christine, people think when you go narrow, you're going to lose sales, you're going to lose people. But when you go narrow, the people who know you can solve their problem, they're an immediate yes, they're ready to go. So I would take that approach. Yeah. I really like that you said that. I think that was a mistake I made. I wish I had gotten that advice earlier. I was the writer who literally took on everything and marketed myself as being able to write anything. Like I understood the concept of niche. So I always stayed in one industry, but I didn't niche down with deliverable or my offer. So I was writing like knowledge base materials, meaning like support, technology support, software support, like click X, click this, like things that were so not what I wanted to be doing. So I really love that advice of like, don't try to offer everything. I'm very upfront now that I don't offer certain things. I I turn down a lot of stuff that I'm asked about because I just don't want to waste my time. Right. And some of that stuff is not worth the mental stress. Like technical writing is a whole thing in and of itself. Like that takes some serious mental capacity for me. So a lot of that too, I guess, is knowing yourself what do you like? What feels easy to write? Where do you feel, you know, fulfilled by it or excited by it? And I think business owners will respect your no, because I know personally, if I'm working with somebody, I want to know what they're willing to do and what they're not willing to do, because then I can go find someone to do that task that really does want to do it. So, cause like as writers, we think that we're being a hero almost by saying, yes, I'll do that. Yes, I can be that person for you. But it's like, no, let that business owner, let your client find someone who specializes in that and who will do a knockout job and who will be really into it if you're not going to be. As someone who is through going through a major transition with a retainer client, I can 100% back that advice that it's better to say no upfront than to give something a go that you're not 100% on board with because then you have to unhook from it and you have to prepare the client for that and kind of explain yourself. And so, yes, it's better to just come out with that no. And obviously we learn as we go, just as you said, and as you did. And so not everything is perfectly avoidable. The lessons come up as we go, but yes, I definitely advocate for that saying no and having that nice, clean experience where they can then go find somebody who's a, who's a great match. Amazing. Well, Jillian, tell everyone what you're up to, how to work with you and how to contact you. I know a lot of people are going to want to reach out to you and give you feedback on the episode and follow you and all that. So tell people where they can find you and how they can engage with you. Sure. So my website is www.jillian-anderson.com. There are two free resources on there. One is for program creators and course creators. It's called Nail Your Price. And there's another free resource on there just for business mentorship. And it's called Six Figures is Peanuts. 
So I just updated that guidebook and it's got like three core business lessons I learned, you know, earlier on that I wish I knew, you know, starting out. So I've got those two things going on. I am back on Instagram. So it's www, well, it's Instagram.com and then it's forward slash Jillian A. Anderson. And I would say those are the places that you can find me. I think that's, that's, I email people. I, I like to send marketing emails. So that's one of the places too. That's my preferred way to communicate as well. Well, I'll definitely drop links to that below, but thank you so much, Jillian. Thank you so much for having me, Christine. It was such a pleasure.